Good, Rick. From Fishing Syndicate. It's great to have you here, my great friend. to be here. Before we get into the bass thing, I want to talk about one kid in particular on our Amigo trip, because I know this is going to resonate with you. I just know it is. So we had a couple of guys. Oh, my God. This, this, oh, I, I guess i got to tell two stories. So a couple of guys who spoke very little English. So I was able to talk with them, and they brought their young son, uh, at least Carlos did, and uh, the kid was 14 years old, and he, I mean, done like one saltwater trip in his life. And so, you know, I, I made sure that there was the language barrier was covered. And before long, we had such a great group, like Jim McFadden, who's now doing these T-shirts, a prince of a guy, provided a shirt for everybody on board the trip. Jim and all the people that were on board could see what was going on, and they wanted to become part of all this. And there was another guy, Horacio, was there also, and just the nicest guy you could ever imagine. Just a prince of a guy. So, I'll start with Horacio first. Horacio gets two tuna, he's pretty hot stick, he's doing really good, and then he hooks one, and he's on this fish for an hour. And, and I'm telling you, Rick, he was just the nicest gentleman you could ever want to meet. So I'm kidding him in Spanish, and we're going back and forth, and uh, I think it was Nick and I, yeah, it was Nick Hawkins, who's a deckhand on the Amigo. We're up in the bow. And you know how those big ones go out? So this fish was out. And I looked out there and I go, geez, look at that shine there. And Nick goes, oh my God. It was 100 pound fish, maybe better. Okay, and he's got it on 30. So he's fighting this fish and fighting this fish. And the fish ends up going under the anchor. And so he's going to hand the rod to Mark Paisano Jr., who ran the boat, did a great job. <sighs> Frickin' fish made a run and pulled the rod out of this guy's hand. Oh. And I just watched it go, shoom, Which you know. is usually what happens in the handoff and trying to manage the anchor. Oh, I wanted to cry. Unusual. He was such a nice guy, you know. And he later told me, the rod and reel, I can buy that, but I wanted to get that fish. That fish, yeah. Yeah. So, all right, that's what I see on. That was a hard break, but it's part of fishing. Yep. But back to Jonathan, the kid. So, you know, I mean, these are big fish, and they're tough fish, and they're hard to hook when you're a novice angler. It was a pick bite. It was what we call a plunker bite, which right. you know. You got to choose a high bait. You got to fish right tackle, all that stuff. And so, Jonathan, you know, I'm, I'm looking at him. He's doing what I'm doing, catching sheep's head and white fish. And I do, people are like, how do you catch sheep's head on a tuna trip? I do that because I can't get tied up on a 60-pound fish, or I'm not going to videotape Jonathan. Exactly. I'm there fish. to videotape. So every, I'm telling you, I work, run into Jim McFadden. He's walking up. We're in a good tuna bite. And what's Jim's concern? He's tying up, and he goes, I'm going to get the kid a fish. So they got a, just a random guy who's keyed in on that. <clears throat> Nick Hawkins, Mark Paisano Jr., the whole crew, we want to get the kid a fish. And so Nick and I are in the bow. Somebody's fighting a fish. We get the fish, and Nick goes, oh, hell, they're not biting the iron, but whatever. And he throws it, and he just goes, yeah, Jonathan. And so we get the kid out there, and he works his fish for a half hour, kind of passing it back and forth. He was getting tired. Anyway, he gets what was a 40-plus pound bluefin to And Rick, you know he's hooked for the rest, of his, for the rest of his life. And, you know, that's such an important thing to do uh, when we're on these trips. You know, you and I have caught a lot of fish and stuff. And if there are kids on board, get them, get them into it. Yeah, once, definitely. Once they hang a fish, they're they're just for life. Absolutely, absolutely. And the thing that you know, the, I think the reason why we have such a deep friendship is because you're that kind of a guy. You would have been, you know, I don't need one. I'm going to get the kid one. And to see the amigo deckhands and captain. Like, every time I ran in, I'm like, I've got to get the kid a fish. Got to get the kid a fish. So, but they, then they get busy, you know. i got to go gap. You know, Mark Paisano Jr. was getting ready to cast a bait, and then somebody needed a gap. So they were juggling all this. But then the passengers got into it, and it was great. Bill Talbot was doing that also. And then there was a lady who came from North Dakota, Cheryl, with her husband Dave. They drove all the way from North Dakota to be on the trip. He hooked a 30-pound and handed it to her. She got a fish. So just that camaraderie, that, that that feeling on board this trip, you got to love it. Oh, absolutely. And that's, you know, a lot of these people that have come and gotten into this bluefin bite and stuff like that, like you said, come from all over the place. They've never caught one. So for guys like you and I that do it all the time, 
uh, Brian over here, he big offshore guy, and that's what we do on these boats. If we hook up, where's the kid? Where's the girl? Or just scream out, who hasn't got one yet? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Pass it over. Right. And you get to, re you know, I don't know if you feel the same way, you get to relive that through their eyes. Absolutely, 100%. We remember our first, you know, and it's like, you get to see the excitement, you get to see that, oh my God, they're so strong, you know, and... 100%. You know, a really, really neat, neat experience to be able to get somebody else involved. As you know, and you and I did a lot of the kids' trips with uh, yeah. elementary school yeah. and such. Oh my God, those things were a blast. Absolutely. You know? Seeing those smiles and that yeah. first tug at the fishing line. You know, uh, people say, don't, don't you like to fish anymore? And I'll tell you what, this guy, Trevante Johnson, has been making a lot of our charters recently. We made one on the Amigo. We were at Santa Barbara. It was horrible weather. It was a really tough trip. We had three yellowtail. But his young son, I believe Noah is 16, had two of the three yellowtail on board. And what made me convinced that videotaping these catches is so important is Trevante was on the Malahini on our last trip, and he came up to me and he said, you know, I've watched that video so many times and shared that with so many family members. And I just looked at him, I go, that's why. I mean, it just confirmed to me, I've caught a bunch of fish. I've, you know, and it's about now, like you, giving like that opportunity to somebody else. To somebody else. Yeah. And you know, today in, in today's age, everybody has a phone, everybody has a, you know, video, everybody has pictures. So all this stuff is so much more documented than when you and I were doing it back in the day. When none of this stuff was in existence, and uh, they get to relive that. They see a they see a, a kid fighting a fish on a video. That kid will watch that video a thousand times. Absolutely. You know. Of course, you know. Got Alex the intern. He likes to videotape me asleep and putting a squid in my ear, which they've done oh, several yeah. times. That's a lot of fun. Lovely yeah, stuff. Yeah. We've done some of that stuff. Remember with yeah. Will? And, oh hell yes. Yeah. Do the get them get them. Uh, hey. You're you're the you're the prank when you, if you fall asleep. Hey, I'll tell you what. It took literally. We were at the bait receiver on this last trip for thirty seconds, and I had six sardines in my boot from Scott Buker. I'm standing there talking to Mike at the bait receiver, and I feel something go a hand go into my boot, and then I feel the wiggling. <laughs> God darn, Scott! All, so all, already you're starting this. We did a, a skiff trip in Newport Beach fishing for spotted bay bass. And I have fallen asleep when I wake up and we start fishing. You know, we had radio, we touched with back and forth with each other. Well, I opened up my backpack to switch out baits. I was already rigged, but I went to switch baits. Bushel of bananas inside my backpack. Oh my God. <laughs> they were funny. trying to even the, you know, level out the plane. Yeah, you know? really. And I was stuffing with bananas. This guy won't get Jenny. <laughs> but, That's uh, funny. Yeah, we do, we do a lot of dumb stuff out there and a lot of fun. Uh, you know, Carmen often asked me, you know, doesn't it bother you to get on a boat all by yourself? I said, I can do that. I'll walk on the boat by myself and I'll walk out with seven, eight, nine new friends. Absolutely. You know, I, I mean, feel the same it's, way. It's fun. Yeah. You know? It's nice to meet people. It's nice to meet good people. It's nice to be in the outdoors. Great to catch fish. Great to see a kid get their, their first fish. It's all part of why we love this sport so much. Right on, you know, it's a, it's a community, you know, the fishing, that fishing community is really, really tight knit, uh, and we've, we've seen that a million times with, uh, you know, when somebody else has needed something, or, you know, somebody's down, we come together for whoever needs it, you know, and that's, uh, it's family. You know, as you know, I've lost my entire family, and I have family. Yeah. You guys, your boys, uh, all these all these people that I've met through fishing are family. Yes, I agree, hundred percent. I met one. I saw Ricky Carvajal. You saw, saw the photo. You commented on it. Oh and Ricky, I mean Philip was. You saw him in the photo. Yeah. Maybe he was six years old yeah. catching yellowtail. And then I walk in the ticket office. There's Ricky Carvajal, who used to run the New Del Mar and exactly. work on a Marina Del Rey for so many years. So good to see him. He's on the Amigo right now. So oh, is he? I'm going to come here tomorrow morning at six and talk to him on camera and do a little something about their trip. Oh, cool. I haven't seen Ricky in a 
long. Yeah, me either. Me either. It was great. All right, let's get into what you're doing because you're the, the bass expert. Many guys out there right now, you know, this. I'm not saying the tuna thing is over, but it's taken a few dips here recently. It could come roaring back. But a lot of guys are starting to turn their attention from fishing tuna, yellowtail. And they're thinking, especially I'm talking about the new guy, the guy that just got a boat, the guy that doesn't know how to walk the rocks and and that and, and that's why I want to turn to you because you're a pro at this. I mean, just so everybody knows, Rick sent me a message at about six thirty this morning and said, Are you awake? And I said, Yeah, I'm at the studio. What's with you? And he goes, I've been here since four thirty fishing. So you were here at four thirty. Yep. If you're working the docks. Yep. Uh, hanging a few down there is a lot of fun. And that's one of the things that the bass fishery has is that it's so accessible. It doesn't take a bunch of planning. You don't even need a boat. Um, a lot of the fish that I catch are all shore-based fish. And in, the, you know, in that time where you're, just because you're fishing from shore, doesn't keep you from a fish of a lifetime. I've caught halibut, you know, close to 30 pounds standing on the rock. That's awesome. So, because those big girls will come back to the back bays and spawn. And so they hang out together. And so you're having a good time and, you know, you catch a lot of bass. I've had 100 bass days from the shore. Wow. So uh, the spotted bay bass, as you know, as you know, there's the sand bass, the spotted bay bass, the caligo bass. The spotted bay bass, pound for pound, is the hardest fighter of them all. They sure are. It seems like it. You know, they, they have more. They're all... They're all grouper family, but that spotted bay bass has more of a grouper mentality than all of them. If the spotted bay bass got to be 10, 12 pounds like sand bass or caligos, they would be hell to pay. <laughs> you're right. You're you absolutely fish, right. You'd have to fish them really heavy. And some of the areas that I fish them on, you go, isn't that a little bit heavy to fish spotted bay bass, you know, 15 pounds? Sometimes that's what you need to turn their head away from that dock. That's because amazing. they will bury it into the pilings under a dock, under a boat, whatever it is, but they're accessible. They're accessible from shore. Just as many as you want. Doesn't take a lot of planning. I do it, well, you saw how early I was up. I'll do it, you know, Brian and I will go and hit the Shoreline Village area, Long Beach, Marine Stadium and stuff. Early in the morning, sometimes I get off of work. There's always rods in my car. So sometimes, right, you know, getting off of work, I'll do that, grab a couple of rods, go over there, Catch, you know, eight, ten spotted bay bass, and I'm, I'm happy. And you, you know? make a point, and that point is, like, when you go to Tanner Bank, you got to dedicate two days, three days. When you go spotted bay bass fishing, land-based, you can squeeze that in on a work day. On a work day. Yeah. Before work, after work, you know. So let's start there. Let's, let's do land-based spotted bay bass fishing. Let's start with where. Where do you fish? Okay, so... You, what are you looking for? You have to understand that these things are cousins to the largemouth bass. They behave and you can actually target them using all the same techniques that you would use for largemouth bass. So my kids would be all over that, right? Oh, so yeah. Being the big bass and guys like there. I've, I've spoken to Patrick and, and Phil about getting out to Newport and maybe do some filming. In yeah, there. You, you guys should do that. On the, on the spotted bay bass scene. Uh, you could catch them. On crankbaits, you could catch them on jerk baits. Uh, you could catch them on, you know, leadhead small swim bait jigs. Um, matching the hatch is a big deal. Now, mind you, they're bass. Sometimes a bass will chase something that's as big as they are and try to eat it. But if you're gonna if you're gonna be successful and you're gonna have a good day, if you're not targeting trophy fish, you gotta match the hatch. If they're on little tiny pinheads like this, that's, that's what they're looking for. That's what they're eating. And so that's what I throw on them, little three-inch swim baits like I did here this morning. And, you know, and that's that's what they were eating. So there's a guy watching this right now saying, well, how do I know what the hatch is? So what's the answer to that? So the answer to that, a lot of times if you, if you go and you walk the shoreline, you will see the small bait fish, little pinhead anchovies, little tiny smelt. And that's what these things will feed on all day long. Um, what you have to do when you're targeting them from shore is understanding what their environment is. They're structure oriented. Eelgrass will hold them. Docks will hold them. Mm -hmm. Rocks will hold them. So you have to fish. If you're fishing in a sandy area, 
you're more than likely not going to get too many of them. Okay. You may get a rogue one or something. Yeah. But you got to target them where they live. And, and that uh, structure, right? That's that really structure. important. So there's a lot of things to, to think about when you do that. Uh, structure is one of them. What's the tide doing? You know, is it, is it minus tide? Is it a good filling tide? You know, as the tide moves up, as you know, it will move the bait fish around. Right. That's when they come <clears throat> out and feed. Right. Usually slack tide is not a good condition to go fish for bass. You can still get them, you know, drop shotting and those techniques that you use finesse. Yes. You can still get them underneath docks and stuff like that. But overall, when it's slack, they're lazy. They're camped out on their docks. They're, they're, they're just hanging out. And fish like that moving water. They feed when you got moving water, When you right? have moving water and moving forage. Yes. Uh, it's on. If, if you go to an area and you see birds plucking away, and, oh man, it's and you have a, a tide that's moving, you're going to get fish, you know. And it's and it's just depending on what technique that you want to use to target these things. Whether you're going to use a, a small swim bait on a lead head and just slow grind it over the bottom if they're a little bit lazy, uh, weedless jig heads, and I'll show you what those look like. And uh, by the way, this is uh, these, these are this is one of our uh, weedless fishing syndicate fishing syndicate weedless yeah. jig heads mm -hmm. that we've developed. Now they're available at the shop and uh, soon to go online. You guys are getting into everything. So that's great. Yeah. So lead head weedless lead heads that will swim through the through the eel grass without that's getting snagged up. Perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. And we have this all the way from you know, two ounces, one and a half ounces, all the way down to a quarter ounce for the smaller baits that you can run through that eel grass. Yeah. And you can just slow roll them through there. A lot of times you feel that you, you feel the eel grass as you're pulling through it and all of a sudden it'll get clear and boom. Yeah. Just as it clears the the eel grass, bang, you get you get bit. Yeah. Um, so they'll hang out there, uh, they'll hang out in the uh, and but eelgrass, they'll hang out on the rocks. Jose is actually asking if we could hold that a little closer to the camera so you can get a better view. What of camera are we holding it? That one right there. You want me to do it? Yeah. Does that look better, Steve? Hold it by the hook yeah. so you can see that. Yeah. So. There you go, Jose. Perfect. All right, there we go. Excellent. And so, <clears throat> just to give you an idea, this is a this is a red crab pattern, and you know. They love red crab. That's our own FS baits that we're coming up with. Uh, those aren't released yet, but those tails. Oh, not released yet. I want that. Yeah. So the, the tails are, are coming, and uh, I had uh, I took these over to uh, Isers uh, this Friday and just shellacked them. Out. Oh, really? Good quality bass. Uh, a lot of that. And those, uh, these swim tails that were coming up, they go, this is a six incher, yeah. but we also have them in all the way down to four inches for that for that smaller presentation. For that matching the hatch again, matching right? Matching the hatch. Very good. Exactly. And so, for spotted bay bass, just understand your surroundings. Inlets and outlets to the mouth of the harbors, it could be uh, just, uh, you know, like... The case in Marine Stadium, you have the Colorado Lagoon. When the tide goes up, the Colorado Lagoon fills up. When the tide goes out, there's a tube that goes through and sends it to the main channel. So when the tide goes up, you got smelt and everything coming out that pipe, and they will sit there and feast on that outgoing course, tide. Of course, right? Yeah. Where is that exactly for the people that are listening? So Marine Stadium is located in Long Beach. If you <coughs> If you look at uh, if you look it up on Google, it'll uh, it'll show you exactly where it is. They do a lot of the water skiing and stuff there, and there's uh, so there's an area at the spillway there that I was talking about that has the a buoy line so the speedboats can't go past that, and you can fish in there all day long. I got a nice striper in there. It's it's basically the channel where Davies Lawn Tramp is and Mother's Beach, exactly. right? Exactly. 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 It all ties in together. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of people that fish Mother's Beach actually for hell. There's a sandy area, not right. not as much eel grass, uh, so they throw dirt baits and stuff in there for hell of it. But 
that whole thing is just like a spawning ground for for spotted bay bass. It has everything that you want. It has eelgrass. It has rocks. It has tons of bait. It has flow. Uh, if you time the tides right, and I like to time, I like to time it to where I'm fishing like the first uh, before an hour before the peak tide, and then an hour after the peak tide, because that's when it's really moving. When it hits peak, it slacks. Right. Then you have to change your presentation. Tying a drop shot on a little spinning outfit, you're going to get bit because you can present. A drop shot is a bait that you can present very slowly, very methodical. Uh, unlike a swim bait that you're going to swim it by them. If they're not really active, they may look at that thing 10 times before they eat it. So can you just explain what exactly a drop shot is for somebody that doesn't know what a drop so shot is? So a drop shot is... There's your main, the, your main line's coming down. The hook is tied directly. There is no loop. There is no. The hook is tied directly to the line. Okay, so that now you have underneath, you have a little span where you can put your uh, your drop shot sinker on, which is usually a little tube one. I didn't bring any, but it's a little tube tube sinker that slides through the eelgrass really easy. You know, it doesn't have. It's it's a stick. So you can put it through the eelgrass really easy. But what you're doing then, if you want to use the right rod, it has to have a little limber tip. I like using spinning for that presentation. And all you do is just rattle the rod tip. When you're doing this, because the bait is tied directly to the line, that bait goes crazy, but in one spot. Right. It looks like an injured bait. It looks like an easy <coughs> meal. And that's, the, that's what they're going to eat if they react to that. You, one of the things you I mentioned do, the rod. And so, I mean, and then you can go, but what rod exactly from Fishing Syndicate would be a good one for that? So, I love my ML, which is a, a spinning graphite rod, RX6 graphite, very limber, very limber tip, rated 6 to 12 pound test. And then also on the hook, use a circle hook. So, the reason for the circle hook, you could catch a 20 pound halibut using that setup. Halibut are very toothy critters. You want that hook on the on the corner of the mouth. Circle hooks generally will not hook inside the mouth of right. the fish, right on the outside. So, I mean, I've caught 20 pounders on eight pound test line. There's a reason for that. That hook is not in their mouth. Right, because they're going to chew through it. If it I gets don't deep, stand right? the chance. Yeah. Especially with halibut, because halibut, what they'll do, you hook them. And you know when you hook the big one because you set the hook and the rod the rod that stays there, and all you get is a big old head shake. That big head shake is when they actually feel that they're hooked, and they will back up and slap their head like this. If the hook, if that line's inside their mouth, you're, dead. you're done. Yeah, it, it's pretty instant. So that's why you want to. That's why I, you I love using the little circle hooks. I don't use mosquito hooks because they will hook inside the mouth, and your chances for landing something big are very slim. Uh, even spotted bay bass have a lot of teeth. Uh, I just found out this morning. Look, I still, <laughs> still have blood in my hand. But uh, yeah, they got a lot of teeth, and they'll they'll chew through line, especially if you're using the, the lighter line. But it's a good presentation uh, when I'm teaching about spotted bay bass fishing inside the bay. Uh, the drop shot is what I teach the most because it's the most successful way for a beginner to catch. Spotted bay bass. No wonder my kids fish drop shot all the time. It's easy it's, for them. Mind you, it's a freshwater presentation. It lets you work very slowly. So you can move that bait and shake it in one place for two, three minutes and slide it two feet and do it again. And they will they will key in on that. And if they see a bait that's not moving like the rest and they're lazy, slack tied, they will hit that. They will hit that. When the tide's coming up, when the tide's going down, when the tide's slack, it doesn't matter. They will eat the drop shot over anything else. But as you learn how to catch them, where they live, how to present your baits, uh, the little swim baits are great. You know, they're they're. Uh, here's a here's an example an example of some of the stuff that I throw out there. And this. Uh, they call this a dart spin. 
So that's got a little blade on the back of it. And as you, that thing goes through the water, that blade will spin at any retrieve rate. It just goes. Uh, this thing gets bit a lot. It's that vibration that... It's vibration. <clears throat> and so the bait itself doesn't have a lot of action, but that blade provides a lot of vibration. Even at night, they'll feel it. You know, fish mostly don't see your bait at night. They concentrate on, you know, they... they sense it with their lateral lines and Correct. such. So, also when you fish them at night, one of the things to keep uh, to keep in mind is that not to set the hook. Wind the fish on. These things will attack in wolf packs, sometimes three and four. If you go to set the hook at night and you do this, the rest of them will lose track of it. If you just wind them in and you miss that fish, the next one, in line the next one behind, it. behind it will pick it up. And so that's why night fishing, I don't really set a hook. Uh, here's another uh, another way that I fish them. This is one of our FSG 800, uh, I believe this one is the MH. And uh, here's, uh, this one's made by Hammer. So there's a little, little paddle tail that mimics exactly what they're feeding on in the harbor. You know, so that thing goes through the water, the tail's kicking. Uh, keep it close to the bottom. You want to feel the bottom on these fish. These fish, uh, overall, is low and slow, and that's that's how you're going to get bit. A lot of people go, how do you know when you get a bite? No, when a spotted bay bass hits your bait. You know. You know. It, it, they hit hard. Rick, uh, you, you mentioned night. Is a, spotted bay bass are nocturnal feeders. They like to bite. If you had your preference, would you pick night over daytime? Overall, regardless of time, I key in on two things. First light, last light. So under both of those conditions, they will hit regardless of time. Okay. Uh, they feel comfortable coming out of cover and feeding in the open instead of hunkering down on eelgrass and stuff when there's low light. Uh, that's, when they'll, that's when they'll bite the most. You know, that's, you know, over the years, fishing the sand bass, right, in twilight. Right. Three, four hundred, you know, sand bass for a sport fishing boat. Uh, they'll feed at night. They feel comfortable on a night feed. And you know what? I, I agree with you. That daybreak and sundown trumps sometimes the tide. Trumps it almost every time. And I can tell you from commercial fishing rock hod, you would think rock hod? We'd frickin' get hammered at daybreak. We'd get a lull in the afternoon. I'm talking about Tanner Bank when I fished commercially out there. And then we knew when the sun was going to set, we were going to start filling 50 hook gangs with all kinds of fish. And just like clockwork, it would it would work every time. It happens with tuna. It happens with bass. It happens with all that stuff. So we have Jose asking a few questions here. Sure. Um, the first ones are, have you ever gone alligator gar fishing? And when is the best time to go alligator gar fishing? That's a bucket list thing for me. Uh, that's uh, I, I've had friends that have targeted them and, and been really successful. I don't know much about that fishery. I sure like to get into it. Red Drum's the other one that I would love to get into. Uh, we'll have to go do that someday. Yeah. Snook, all that stuff. I want to I want to get into that. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And then the the next question is, is the bait caster reel the best way to catch these fish that you're targeting? Okay, so my my take on the bait caster when I when I flip out a bait caster, unlike the spinning, I have my my finger on the line. Oftentimes, all you feel is tick. That's it. And for the most part, when you feel that tick, that tick is the lead head hitting the back of the fish's throat. Get tight in a hurry. You have them then. So re you wind down slow. Once once that you get that tick with a with a bait casting, I feel two things, and and this is important too. I have a lot more cast control with a bait caster than I do a spinner. Uh, that's on top of me being able to feel that line on a constant basis because when you hold a bait caster. like so, and you're winding, that's where my finger is. 
I'll feel a fish breathe on that. And using a nice graphite sensitive rod like this, man, you feel everything, especially with braid that doesn't stretch. Yeah. You'll feel it. So would you say that with the bait caster, it's just a lot more sensitive because you're constantly contact, you have constant contact with the line, so everything kind of telephones through every little bite, telephones exactly. through the fishing line to the basically the tip of your fingers, right? Exactly. When you're fishing spinning, you feel, you feel what happens on the tip of the rod when you get, actually get hit. You, you'll miss a lot of the pressure bites or when that fish actually hits your bait and swims towards you, you won't feel that like you do with this. Because you, if, if you feel, a lot of times, like I was just casting the dock here, made a long cast, had my, my finger on the line, all of a sudden, sudden I felt tick and I just wound down, boom, he was on it. I probably would not have felt that on the spinning. Um, Mostly because I have mono on spinning and uh, braid has no stretch. In between the, the the braided line, the graphite, and my finger on the line, I can feel anything. And so. And Rick, why is that important for the guy that's listening? And Jose, great questions by the way this morning. Yeah. So feeling what, that. What happens is anything that you feel unnatural, and I tell people this all the time. You don't get charged for swinging on a fish. <laughs> it's free. If it feels unnatural, or even if your rod tip just gets heavy. You know, I had a friend and we were we were throwing Lucky Craft off the beach uh, close to sunset. Oh, uh-huh. And, Recently? Uh, this was a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. And I see him and he's whipping his rod tip. And I said, what's going on? He goes, oh, I got kelp. I said, get tight on that kelp, man. Swing on it. Oh no, it's kelp, dude, look, look, and it's rods all bent over and not, nothing's happening and all of a sudden it's <laughs> kind of like 15 pound halibut. Nice. So you don't always, you don't always feel the hit depending on how that fish picks up that bait. Um, bass are a little different in that bass pick up your bait and boom, and they turn and they run for cover. So you usually feel something, but there's a lot of times when the when you're bringing in your bait and it comes up behind you and grabs the bait, and all you'll feel is pressure. That's what they call a pressure bite. Your rod tip just gets heavy. Swing on it. You're not being charged for it. Man, get a swing on That's that. That's great advice. You'd be amazed how many fish you catch just because you felt something that was unnatural on the tip of the rod. And all these graphite rods have that that very sensitive. And they're very responsive because all graphite is fast. So you get a good, good quick hook set on the fish. Unlike the freshwater bass, a freshwater bass will pick up a creature bait and you literally can't swing on it. You have to wait till your line moves to know that that fish has it. Not, not with saltwater bass. They're more aggressive. They're more aggressive. When you got hit, you just ate that bait. Swing on them. If you're fishing at night, wind on them. Just get tight. Uh, we do the same thing with leadhead and squid when we're, you know, when we're fishing structure. We're we're feeling the rock, feeling the rock, and all of a sudden it just bam. Rod tip gets heavy. And you better start. You better wind for your dead. life. Yeah. And you better be at least on forty pound test line because they'll break you off. They're going right into the line. structure. Again. Right on. That's right. Yep. That's absolutely. I have another awesome. question from John. Uh, he says, "Good morning. The small swim bait that was on that spinner tail with that spinner tail. What is that called, and where can I get them?" Okay, so Big Fish Bait and Tackle has a good selection of them. Uh, One of our sponsors. Thank yeah, you, Rick. Yeah. So those are hammer. Those are the new hammer three-inch baits. Uh, pretty durable. Oh, the spinner tail. The spinner tail one. Oh, the spinner tail. Big Fish Bait and Tackle. They carry them as well. That's so one of the things Thank that uh, I got turned on to uh, at one of the Fred Hall shows. And they gave me a couple of baits to try out. I just looked at it and said, this thing's going to get big. Sure enough, it was crazy good. And uh, so I talked to Rod up and Big Fish Bait and Tackle, and he brought them in. So we, you know, we it's in the shop. Uh, as well as these lead heads that you're seeing, uh, they're, they're in the Big Fish Bait and Tackle as well. And they have, a, they have a good selection of baits. 
the, that whole area of Seal Beach is a mecca for uh, spotted bay bass fishing, surf fishing for halibut. Uh, yeah, you and I've done that several times exactly. together. That's good, good times. And those are the dart spins, right? <clears throat> they're they're called the dart spin. That's a model, dart spin. and they're made by Hyperplastics. If, if Hyperplastics, a uh, company called Band of Anglers. Yeah. So. Uh, a note on those dart spins, do not put them together with your regular plastics. It's a different chemical. They will melt everything in your box. Really? However, I have caught over a hundred fish on just one bait. Wow. And in those hundred fish was a yellowtail included, multiple calico bass, multiple spotted bass. So they're bass. extremely durable. Very durable. Yeah. One bait will last you a long time. Wow. Are they more expensive? Yes, you know, for but a two pack, it's you're gonna pay eight dollars, you know, seven something. But a bait that's gonna last you that long. Makes you don't it need work. a box full of them. Yeah, you know, you get two or three packs of those things, you're good to go. Uh, they come in, in several different colors, you know, a brown bait type of color, like you guys saw with a chartreuse blade. I don't know what it is about spotted bay bass and chartreuse. They smash that bait. Uh, we were on a trip together where we were uh, took the kids out. Uh huh. Catalina Island, and I was using that same chartreuse head on a wham tail, and I think I showed you on the trip, the bait had been bitten off right at the hook. You did, no I remember tail. that. That was like six, seven years ago, right? right? Yeah. Bait had no tail on right. it. Right. And you threw that out, and you, got, you kept getting bit, I even remember. with no tail on it. So it's the chartreuse part of it, I think, that does something to them. It's a really, really good color. If you see everything I have, has something chartreuse on it. But, yeah, you know, you guys, if you want to fish spotted bay bass, first of all, fish inside the bays. They're not super common outside the bays. Uh, every once in a while, somebody, you know, whacks one outside, but that's very unusual. Uh, so inside the bays, you can fish inside of Marina del Rey, We're Long Beach, you know, Huntington Beach, Alamitos. <laughs> Those things are loaded with spotted bay bass. Redondo used to be really Redondo. good. Redondo, Redondo yeah. used to be really good, yeah. and I think it's bouncing back now for yeah. that red tide kill off. Oh, okay. Uh, so now we're getting a lot of that. As a matter of fact, there's been stripers inside of Redondo. My buddy just got have you know schools of them come through. Wow, that's awesome. In the same in Marina del Rey. So wow, that's a weird fish for up here. Yes, and uh, a lot more common nowadays. I don't know what's changed, but they've wandered down this way. Let me just uh, remind everybody that at the end of today's show, i got to get Alex to give me a cup of coffee. Um, we're going to do the Freeman Adventures Tackle Grab. You have to be a Patreon member. It's only 5 bucks a month. There's time for you to join right now. Steve can put a link in there, I think. He'll do that for you all, and you'll be able to uh, join us for that. And um, what else was I going to say? I was going to ask Rick if you had to give us your top three Spotted Bay Bass spots current right now guys that are listening and if you can sp spread them out a little bit that'd be great yeah. but if, if not what would you give us so Newport Bay incredible bay bass fishery that's one Huntington Harbor and any of those areas where you can park and access from shore uh, Huntington Harbor has a lot yeah uh, you can do really, really well without ever stepping on a boat or a float tube or a kayak or anything else. I've caught, you know, three pounders. Heck, I just got a nice almost 20 inch uh, spotted bay bass inside of Huntington Harbor. That's a nice one. That's a nice one. Yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> Marina del Rey, another area uh, in the ma main channel there where the condos are and even where the, you know, where the bridge is at, La Bologna Creek, Creekside. Really good bite there. Early morning, you can catch a lot of bass there, uh, and it's a mixture. You you get sometimes you I've caught you know big five pound sand bass that wander off the break wall at Marina del Rey, which is a short hop, right, to Bologna Creek. The same with halibut. You know halibut up to twenty something pounds in that in that little canal where the Bologna Creek is at. Uh, but in front of the condos where the Venice Canal dumps into Marina del Rey. Another great area to fish uh, for a variety of stuff, not only spotted bay bass. That's why I tell you that you can catch a fish of a lifetime fishing from shore. Yeah. Because a lot of these fish know when these, these uh, canals are emptying out into the main channel and different areas of lagoons that empty out into main channels, 
They'll congregate there. They know that it's like a dinner bell for them. They see the tide moving, they move in. So what are some resources that you use to know when is a good time to go? Like what should people look at, whether it's tide tables, moon phases, things like that. Um, what should people look at so they know, okay, this is when I need to go, this is when the fish are going to bite? If you have a moving tide at low light, either first light or last light, oh man, that is heaven. it's like pouring gasoline on a horse. Yes, fire. definitely. And you will get tons of them. Uh, there's an app that I use that is free, it's called Tide Free, that gives you the, uh, it gives you the, the tidal movements with a graph. So it tells you how much displacement you have, um, which is a really, really neat option. And that's, uh, I don't know if you guys can see it, but that's what the chart looks like. So if you see that red line, that red line is right now. That's what the tide is doing right now. That's high peak. <coughs> very, 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 very slow. That There's no movement of water right now. It's right. peaked out. So if you look at that graph, an hour after that, you'll see this start dropping off. So an hour after that red line, that water starts dropping off. Water's moving. So it doesn't matter whether it's rising or falling. If you guys are just starting out in the bay bass thing, try to hit them early or late afternoon. They seem to be more active then. I was just pointing out to Brian that I was fishing from 4.30 and we weren't, you know, I wasn't getting a lot of bites. As soon as it started getting light outside, you saw all the life started to happen. You saw the, the seagulls up, yes. you saw the seagulls diving in the water, bait moving around. And I told Brian, I said, they're going to bite now. And sure enough, you know, hung a few immediately when, when we had those conditions. They were literally eating the bait on the drop. Uh, for you guys, when you fish the deeper water, uh, that bait's going to drop down through the water column. Make your cast, let that bait hit the water. Go into gear, feel that bait all the way down. If that, if you haven't hit bottom and all of a sudden you get slack on your line, wind. You got a fish on. It just picked it up on the drop. Using the bait casters, you get a lot more feel. So a lot of times when you cast that and your bait is sinking, even though you didn't feel the, the, you know, the tug, you felt the tip and your line slacked. It's on. It's set the hook or wind, depending on what time of day you're fishing. But overall, low and slow. If you're just starting out on it, try the drop shot. Uh, later on, I'll put it on my Facebook or whatever. It's, it's a neat way when you tie these things up and... When you see that rig actually put together, you go, wow, that's, that get, will get big. You, you know, one thing about resources that I'd like to mention is, because I've been covering fishing in Southern California for 40 years or something like that, and I've seen every single winter some dad and his kids get washed off the rocks in really windy, rough weather. You need to really pay attention. It's not an issue right now. I mean, it's 90 degrees out. But when you get to those wintertime storms, some people don't pay attention to that. And inevitably, there's a tragedy that happens. So there's going to be lots of nice days in your future. You don't have to go when it's really hazardous conditions. And I admonish everybody to pay attention, especially if you're taking kids out fishing. Yeah. Tragedies like that do occur. I'll be honest with you. I would never take a kid out on a break wall. Um, just a, a lot of bad things can happen. Uh, not even having to do with a wave, you know. Kids sometimes don't know, hey, if those rocks are colored green, stay away from that. Yeah, no kidding. It is soap. But, you know, we've seen it. We've seen it happen in Redondo Beach. Could be a nice day. You'll get a rogue wave yeah. and one that clears the wall. That's not a place for a kid to be. And it doesn't need to be because fishing for spotted bay bass and halibut and stuff could be done inside the harbor without any of those dangers, even off the, you know, uh, shoreline uh, piers across from the Queen Mary. Uh, great place to take kids and fish, spotted bay bass, halibut, all kinds of stuff wandered in. We've got thresher sharks in, off the pier there. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of places that you can take kids that are safe. Uh, the spotty fishery, heck, you don't, you don't need to put anybody in danger. It's just fish inside the calm waters of the harbor. That's really where the fish are at. 
you know, if you want to fish caligo bass and stuff, and you want to get out on a break, well, yeah, you could do that. But still dangerous. I'd really be careful. My wife gives me advice. She says, yeah, go ahead and do that. Just double the life insurance before you go. Exactly. Yeah. What do you got, a mill? I need two. Right. Yeah. So let's let's go, um, if you don't mind, let's jump on a boat. And there's a lot of private boaters <laughs> out there. And there's some guys who, you know, they don't have a clue, right? And there's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm not saying that disparagingly. I'm just saying I, I'm the worst. You know, anchoring on a spot or getting on a spot is way more difficult than you might think. So if a guy is going to go out of San Pedro or anywhere for that matter, how do they approach it? Now now we're talking sand bass and calico bass, right. right? Right. And so there's two ways that you can do it. The same rules apply. Water movement, structure, and bait. And that gasoline moment, if you can find that high tide at daybreak or sundown, Man, you're so right about that. I've seen that happen in surf fishing all the time. All the time. Yeah. So, you know, look for birds along the kelp line and stuff like that. I was with Carmen. We went and had breakfast at this place out in San Pedro. And uh, we drove off to the cliffs there. And I was watching the kelp line. I mean, I'm sure she's... <clears throat> I made a joke about it later. I said, hey, no lie, guys. There was calico boiling on the kelp line. You know, I'm looking for stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I saw the birds pecking away, and I started playing, paying close attention, and there they were. They were blowing up, you know, a bunch of calico bass. So All of us fishermen, you've got this romantic moment where you, you should be taking your wife's hand, looking into her eyes, and telling her how much you love her, and you're looking for calico bass. But all of us guys are the same on that. Yeah, Just we're... last week, we took our daughter to the Redondo Beach for the first time, yeah. and she was playing in the sand. And I'm focused on all the birds working. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. This first moment, your daughter, and you're looking for fish boilers. <laughs> when you have that passion, then you, you can't, you're, you're always looking for life, you know? And so, when you're fishing on a boat, you can target what they, you know, what we know as visible structure, the kelp line. Right. And, and stuff like that. Does that work? It works like a charm. Calico bass live in the, that's why they call them kelp, kelp bass. bass. Yeah. Right? Uh, one of the beauties about when, and I fish a lot heavier when I'm fishing the kelp line. It is not unusual to be fishing for calico bass and hang a 40 pound white sea bass. Right. You know, it happens, so you fish heavier. I use 30 and 40 pound leaders. Fluorocarbon is an issue when you're fishing artificials or not? Is it yes. important? It's, it's super important. Okay. I, I, fish, uh, I fish what I call kelp cutter rigs, so my reel is completely full of braid, and I'll use a three three foot leader, 30, 40 pound, uh, something that I can, you know, bring in uh, a larger fish. Yellows hang out in the kelp. You never know. Right. You right. Know. And we like Opsin fluorocarbon, by the way, everybody. www.opsinusa.com. Yeah. But I'll it have, is important. I'll have to try some of that stuff. I'm going to get you some for sure. I've heard it's good. Yeah. It's really good. Uh, so, yeah, you know, when you're targeting visible structure, it becomes easier because you you know when you have targets. That's why practicing your casting, guys, is really super important. Being able to place the bait in the right spot is what's going to get you bit. Sometimes three feet makes a difference. Uh, if you're casting kelp pockets and, you know, you can see where the pockets are, if you flip a bait into that pocket, Nine out of ten times, that's where you're going to get bit. Yeah. If you can't hit that pocket, you're not going to get bit. You're going to be up on top of the weeds. You're not. Uh, uh, one of the things about fishing the kelp, that's why we use the the weedless lead heads. That helps you navigate the kelp without hanging up because the hook is covered, it's protected. You're not going to, you're not, you know, you're not going to hang that bait in the kelp, and so you have a chance to present that. Now, you and I have, have both fished that. On a good tide, when the water's moving, it lays that kelp down. So you have a gap between the top and the kelp. You can fire a jig way back into the kelp and just roll it over, and you can see them. You can see them, and you have all the gold flashes. So you know? isn't it? But then you have to have that. That's why I like the kelp cutter <clears throat> rig, because if you do hang a 10-pounder and it buries you down into the kelp, that braid will help you saw through that kelp and land that fish. If you're on mono, there's stretch, there's all kinds of factors, you won't get that fish. So give yourself a better chance when you're fishing the kelp 
to fish a kelp cutter rig. Uh, this is one of the this is one of the outfits that I use. This particular one here is. Uh, what kind a, of, what's the rod? So the rod is a saltwater all-purpose graphite by Fishing Syndicate. Uh -huh. This one is uh, rated 1530. Really nice tip. This is a nine footer. I can cast this bait a country mile. Uh, this is the, the actual setup. I haven't even taken it apart from uh, Friday when we went fishing for the for the sand bass at Iser's Reef. And you can see by the you can see by the bait it's got uh, battle scars. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. So. Hold it to the right more, or your left, yeah. There we go. Is that good? Yep. Right. So yeah, that, that bait will swim right through the kelp, and it also helps you get through <coughs> structure without getting hung up. As you know, the either reeds are a bunch of concrete pipes there laying on the bottom. Right. It's a big area. It's a big area. Should you drift that? And it, that's exactly what I would do. Yeah. I would drift it because if you set up on a good drift, the first thing you do when you get when you get to an area like that. As you go find the structure, whatever's set up, watch what the drift does. Now, you're saying drift, but that's only under the conditions that you're fishing artificials, right? You're, drifting is not something you would do if you were chumming, if you were, you know, fishing bait. No, you would anchor up in right. the case. Right, exactly, okay. So, so, and, and that, but just to let everybody know, the anchor gods get a lot of anchors on Isers. Right? Isers is an anchor <laughs> collector. Yes. Yeah. 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 It adds to the structure. Yeah, it does. You're, you're contributing even, to the structure. Even the sport fisher sometimes, ah, I lost an anchor there. And if a guy wants to know how to find Isers Reef, you can come to 22nd Street Land and they print these charts now where you can find all these spots. Once you find them, that's where Rick comes in and talks about how to catch them once you get there. Yeah. And then going back to the swim bait jig heads that you just demonstrated, when a guy walks into a tackle store and he asks the guy, hey, where are your jig heads? I heard Rick Fuentes talking about them on the podcast. Um, and he, you know, the guy points out, oh, they're in aisle two. Go, go check them out. The guy walks down aisle two. And he sees this long wall of all kinds of jig heads. The weedless, the non-weedless, the you know, big he heavier heads, the lighter heads, the, uh, the ones with the little uh, spinner uh, on, the, on, it, on it. Can you explain what each jig head, you know, as far as your type of fishing, what each one is specifically for and how people should, should utilize each style of jig head? Absolutely. So depending on the depth you're fishing, Depending on the current that is present, or if you're drifting and you're moving, you know, the, the wind is up, you want to use those heavier lead heads to be able to hold bottom to get bit. So now you're using big, bigger lead heads. Um, I was on a trip with a friend recently, and it was blowing at the Isers. Uh, it was blowing pretty good. So he's using light bait and 8 ounces of weight. And he can't hold bottom. And this is just so people have an idea. How, how deep are you guys fishing? 100 feet. Okay. So we're in 100 feet of water. It can't hold bottom on an 8 ounce. Eight eight ounce yeah. So, mind you, if your, boat is, if, if your boat is being pushed by the wind this way, and you drop your lead head next to the boat, by the time it hits bottom, you're way there, you're past the structure. Yeah. So what I was doing was the complete opposite. I was casting it up current, so by the time it got to the bottom, I was next to the boat, and it was on. Two grinds and the fish were just crushing that bait. And he was asking me, how are you holding bottom using a one ounce bait? I can't hold bottom on an eight ounce bait. Play with the current, cast it up current, let it come back, You'd still, you'll still hit the bottom, Especially if you're using braided lines. Braided lines are very, very thin diameter lines, and you can get to the bottom. Even when you're rock cutting and stuff. You know, I do a lot of jigging for rock cutting where I'm using 30-pound braid, and I can get to the bottom with four ounces when these guys are using 40, you know, pound mono, and they can't hold bottom on, on 16 ounces. And I do a lot of jigging for that, so same concept. I can get down, there's a lot less drag on that thinner diameter line than there is on thick 40 pound model. Yeah, and I, so that's how you want to get I it. was up in the bow on the Amigo on this last trip and I was casting the opposite direction of everybody else up in the bow 
and then by the they're trolling for yep. a rock eye, exactly. and I'm straight up and down. Straight and up and down, and that and, and it's immediate. Yeah. You know, once you once you hit bottom, but the problem with them is they're dropping it down next to the boat or off the back of the boat where the where the current and the drift is going, and by the time they hit bottom, they're so scoped out that they're not getting bit or they're off the structure. Right. You know, depending on the size of the structure, but lead heads. It all depends on where the fish are, and if you if you're on your boat, uh, I was fishing with a friend of mine just recently off of Malibu, and he goes, "Hey, this is one of my rock, my, you know, one of my rock cut spots, 140 feet of water." And so I'm looking at his meter, and there's fish suspended at least 30 feet off the top of the structure. Good chili pepper bite, huh? So That's he tells me, he goes, "Dude, solid rock fish here," and I turn around and I smile at him. Guess who that was? It was Ed. Was it calico bass said, or chili pepper? I said, that's bass, dude. Oh, there you go. Took a dart spin on a one ounce set, flipped it out there, boom, hit the water, started sinking. <laughs> Big old calicos. That's, that's awesome. That's what we're sitting on. That's awesome. So sometimes, you know, that's one of the things that, that you have to uh, remember about the bite. That deep water structure, sometimes when they're not feeding actively in the kelp or whatever, they're hunkered down on structure. And you fish some of that deeper structure with the heavier lead heads, get down to the bottom and swim and swim the bait. Uh, you're going to get bit down there, uh, and you can see it on your meter. If you have, if you're a private boater and you look at your meter, you see exactly where that, where the bait is, where the fish are hanging out, and so that's how that's how you present it, and you get bit a lot more a lot a lot of times, especially when the sun is up high. Those fish go in way into the kelp and hunker down or they go back and they sit in deep water structure and some of the smallest structures that you can find there's a few here off the 105 that they're small spots the sport fishing boats won't fish them because they're small spots but guess what they hold trophy calicos eight ten pounders you go through there and you can actually as you're sliding through there's several of them. If the drift is right, you hit them all, and you can get bunches of calico bass dragging a plastic through there. Uh, Rick, I'm going to let you continue to answer Steve's excellent question about all those different lead heads. But one thing I think that's worth pointing out is that you need to bring a variety of that stuff because you never know what conditions you're going to be presented with on a given day. So if you go out and you're prepared for slack current, and all of a sudden you have a ripping current, you're going to be in big trouble. So right. it sounds like you need to diversify your tackle. Exactly. And, it, you know, different presentations. So when I go out and I'm fishing, just fishing bass, I always carry a jig stick. By the way, these are our Fishing Syndicate branded jigs, surface irons. Those are beautiful. Uh, Man, I could throw that a hundred miles. Yeah. That feels so that's like. got a that's got a little uh, that's got a little twist to it that you won't find in many days. These things glow in the dark. So imagine during a white sea bass bite, lighting that that thing will light up. So they they all glow. I like this color for yellowtail. Yeah, that mid and white is is. Excellent for yellowtail. Uh, I was actually getting uh, getting bit the other day uh, close to the rigs, uh, throwing this pattern, the scrambled egg pattern, and they were bass. Um, There's so, nothing like catching bass on the surface iron. So those so are fun. these are these come in a surface iron. And by the way, if you got that ripping current that Phil was talking about, that kelp is laying down, grab a jig stick. Throw a big iron. You talk about trophy fish. They will eat the calicos. Will eat the surface iron. Oh, uh, especially so when good. that kelp is laying down and you have bait <clears throat> present, uh, and it doesn't keep you from hanging that white sea bass. One of the other presentations that I love. I gotta show you guys a couple, a couple more, uh, more gigs here. So this is in the same lineup, and these are our yo-yos. There's a mint and white. These are heavy. So as, if you notice, that's our design is uh, very, very. 
it's very thin, it's got good flutter, and then when you rip them up, they have good action. These things, and as you know, man, it's it's fun to catch yellows and stuff on the yo-yo. They they are ruthless when you. When I you love hang. that. Yeah, there's nothing. When better. the yo-yo, you're just winding, and all of a sudden, <clears throat> nothing better. So this is one of my staples of going out and kelp fishing. Stick baits. A lot of different companies make them. This particular one is made by Daiwa. It's called an SP Minnow. Uh, that bait will only sink out a couple of feet, but it's got a wobble that's just incredible. So I took this on our our Mal Malahini trip. I you guys were on the day right after us, weren't right? You? Yeah, dismissed you. And so it was a tough. It was a tough bite. People were uh, people were running over. Uh, skips were running over the foamers that. Two foamers that we found, so they sank out. We did find a small kelp patty that looked like it had some life on it, and so Bill said, "Hey, here they come! Here, here comes over here. It's not a big, it's not a big kelp, but it looks like it's got fish underneath it. The yellows are eating this. I got yellows on this. Oh, nice! On the on the 1530 bass rods, it's the all-purpose graphite, but calicos love this." You take this stuff to Catalina, or you take it to any shallow water reef or on boiler rocks, you cast it and just wind it back. These things will come charging out of the water with backs out of the water and eat this thing. You don't have to worry about choosing a good hot bait either, because that is a yeah, good is, hot bait. That right? is a hot bait. Shout out to Greg Johnson from Dawa, by the way, who's going to have a baby next month, and we send him our very, very, very best. So that, that's a great design, and these stick baits are dynamite on calico bass especially fishing around kelp line and stuff. Uh, the only thing that I change, if I'm going to be throwing them straight into the kelp or the kelp's not laying down enough for me, is I go to single replacement hooks on these so it doesn't snag up the kelp too much. Right. But stick baits are awesome. Uh, weedless uh, lead heads and, and swim tails, really, really good. Rick, could you talk about what kind of tackle you fish the stick bait with and the retrieve method? Does okay. it vary according to species? So, overall, what I'm using to throw it is usually a 15 to 30 or a 20 to 40 all-purpose graphite rod. And if you watch these things and you straight grind it, these things, these things swim at any speed. For bass, I slow it down. If they're yellowtail and stuff around the area, I speed it up. And they crush these things. I was getting 30 pounders on this bait at Anacapa when they were thick up there. Uh, guys were going, hey, you know, we can't get bit. Well, guess what? It just so happened that the fish were not responding to 30 or 40. You could cast a live sardine on 30 or 40 into the boils and you weren't getting bit. I went down to 20 through this instant, instant blow up. And that wasn't, that wasn't casting into the boil. I went to the bow to cat cast this. The captain's watching me. He goes, what did you just throw? I said, a stick bay. I took to grind. Boom! It just exploded <laughs> on it. Nice. And so that's what, it, it turned into a jig that I used for fish finding. You know, and to see how they would react to it. They weren't eating the iron. They were eating uh, heavy baits. But what we found out by using this is that they were light line. Uh, as a lot of these fish are right now. Some of these bluefin, you have to fish on 20 pounds with very small hooks. It's a pain in the neck, and you know what happens inevitably. You hook that 100 pounder, and, and those things have teeth, and that can, there goes your circle hook advice about trying to hook. I mean, they have teeth, and the long, the lo you know, I, I'm just sitting out there, and when a guy's on a 60 pounder, the longer that goes on, the, the more they can go wrong. So, yep. yeah, I know what you mean. They're, they're toothy critters, and you know, small. What I've been using is size two, size four circle hooks on the tuna, on 20 pound. And usually when I'm out there on tuna, but I know we're talking about bass, this is one of the rods that's my favorite. It's a uh, FSC 800H 30 to 60. This rod, uh, I want you to feel this because I know you haven't felt it yet. One of our flagship rods from Fishing Syndicate. Feel the weight on this or what? Feel the weight on that. Yeah, it's light. It's light, right? 
it's a beast. We yeah. landed, you know, tuna over 100 pounds on it. Wow, that's nice. Super so, light. Very light. <clears throat> and if you if you catch a, one of the things that these rods have is that forgiving tip. It's RX6 graphite, e-glass to the top. Very forgiving. It's hard on the fish. It's not hard on you. That RX6 graphite on the back has a lot of structure, a lot of backbone, and yet the tip is very forgiving. A lot of times when you're fighting a big tuna like that and you're on light line and you have a stiff rod and you know, here, you know, that hook is wearing a hole in that fish's yeah, mouth. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no book, there's no stretch, there's no bungee action on that fish. And like you said, the longer the fight goes on, the bigger that hole in the mouth gets, and you, you're more than likely, you know, a lot of heartbreak. Absolutely. Uh, You're watching Free Minute Adventures, by the way. Our special guest from Fishing Syndicate is Rick Fuentes. At the end of today's show, we will have a Free Minute Adventures tackle grab. Steve, what is up for grabs today in the tackle grab? So this week we got a bunch of goodies from Fishing Syndicate that... Uh, that uh, Rick brought with him. We have some stuff, some jigs from Ahi USA. We have a uh, big fish tackle hat, and then we have some stuff from Opsin fluorocarbon as well. We're going to be doing a $25 gift card to Opsin. It's going to be a code that you can enter on their website and have some stuff, order some stuff for you to fish with. This so season. you get all that stuff? All that stuff for just $5 a month. $5 a month. Basically, and there's four giveaways that we're doing every week, so it's literally a, like, less than $1.50 per giveaway. Oh, that's awesome, man. You have to be a Patreon member. It's easy to do. It's 5 bucks a month, as Steve said. And only, I hope you have something in that package for my voice, Steve, because I could use it. Uh, it's easy to do. There's a link up there for you to sign up. And uh, we hope you do, because Rick's brought a lot of great stuff. And uh, I'll tell you, we are thrilled with how many people are taking advantage of that. Um, Rick, um, let's talk about the Fishing Syndicate rods. You've talked a little bit about it. You've touched on it. But my kids are going to be excited to know. You've come out with a whole bass fishing series of rods, haven't you? We have everything covered <clears throat> now uh, from the panfish guys that like to fish trout. All the way up to unlimited for the guys who want to pull high a kite and get those, you know, even swordfish rods. So we have everything covered. We've developed a line of bass rods and and uh, we call the bays and lakes. That is incredible. All RX6 graphite with incredible action for a graphite rod. Uh, usually you associate graphite with being extra fast, very fast rods. Uh, the action that we put on this. Uh, is incredible. They load up beautifully. They cast a long way. So whether you're look, you know, throwing lucky craft in the surf on the spinners, or fishing the bay bass, uh, largemouth, stripers, uh, that whole lineup of bass rods, uh, we're super excited about. And uh, we have a lot of guys that fish uh, freshwater bass tournaments that are using them now. And uh, we're even adding to that lineup. It's been so successful and had such great reviews that we're adding to it. On top of that, uh, we have the all-purpose graphite saltwater uh, version that are 1530, 2040, uh, good boiler rock, uh, break wall rods. Uh, as you know, when you fish the break wall and you know you're hanging fish right up on the structure, you need to be able to turn your head. Graphite gets it done. Uh, those rods also load up beautifully and cast uh, even the small baits a long way. Uh, our flagship, which is our all-purpose composites here, uh, these things are so proven. They're on several boats already. They're on the T-Bird in San Diego. They're on the Outrider in San Diego. Uh, they're on the Tomahawk. They're uh, several operations, and a lot of operations down south of the border that are now using <coughs> our rods and Cedros and everywhere else. Uh, with great reviews. We've landed uh, on a rail rod, we've already landed uh, tuna over almost 400 pounds, 390 on our rail rod. Really? On the outright. Well, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, so, very high quality, durable rods. They're light, they're sensitive, they're powerful, they're easy on you, very hard on the fish. Uh, one of the guys watched me fight a, a 50 pound bluefin on the tomahawk on. Uh, on 20 pounds. 
I'm stupid. I should never throw that. <laughs> oh my god, it turns into a nightmare, doesn't it? it really does. I was on it. Uh, there was a couple of people on. I couldn't get bit, uh, and I said, "Well, I just could throw 20." And I throw 20, and you know, hung a 50 pounder on 20 on one of our, our uh, light composites, a 1530. Yeah. And the deckhand was kind of admiring. He goes, wow, that rod works. I said, yeah. I said, I'm old, man. That's what I need. <laughs> I need something that's easy on me and hard on them. And, you know, it took a little while, but that was my biggest fish on the trip was a 50-pounder. I wound up getting four on that trip. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of fun, high-quality rods, uh, still great warranties. We designed our own blanks. All of our blanks are designed by us. They're rolled overseas to keep the price affordable. affordable, but affordable without sacrificing any quality. Uh, we're big on, on quality control, so everything is right. By the time we develop rods and we prototype them and we get out there and we fish them, by the time it gets out to the public, it is exactly what we want. Uh, we're excited because we have uh, a new 90J coming out, S-Glass, all glass rod, that we finally got the right, the right blank, the, the right way, the right action, everything. We went through about four different versions until we got it dialed into exactly what we wanted. Uh, Oliver Solis, our boss, have taken it out on some of the San Diego trips. He's already landed bluefin, yellowfin on it, uh, yellowtail. Um, just loads up beautifully, cast beautifully. I'm waiting on mine. It's somewhere on one of those container ships out there. Yeah, really? Uh, you may be waiting a while. No. Uh, Hopefully not. We, uh, we're going to be waiting. But, but I'm excited about that coming out. So we're constantly, we haven't stopped there. We're continuing to develop. We're developing fly rods as well. Uh, but nothing comes out and nothing hits the public's hand until it's right on. So it's been a... You know, I once represented a larger, larger company, and came over here, and I am in love with this brand. I'm in love with what, um, you know, the commitment to quality is incredible. And so, I'm telling you, if you guys haven't, if you guys haven't uh, checked us out, we're at 200 South Beach Boulevard in La Habra, and uh, you could also look at our website, uh, www.fishingsyndicate.com. And there's a full website there. You guys can order online. We have free shipping. Uh, unless, of course, it's nine-foot rods, then we we have to charge uh, shipping on those. But anything else, it's free shipping. If you come into the shop and buy a rod, hey, we'll hook you up with some swag uh, as you go out the door. Uh, we are really big on customer service and taking care of our people. So also great supporters of our first responders and military. Good for you. I uh, do a lot of work with them. So, cool company to work for. Uh, I'm blessed to be there. I mean, whoever thought uh, after all 45 years working in the grocery business that I was going to land a dream job, you know? And so it's been it's been really really cool uh, going through and helping development and and the, the different things that we're working on. And, and Rick, cool. your endorsement to me, I mean, it's got to be a great company because I know the kind of person you are. Yeah. And you're not a BS or you're not going to tell people it's a quality product if it's not. And, and you're a good fisherman, you've been doing it your whole life. Yep. It's your passion. So that endorsement means a lot to me and it should to all of you also. Yeah. So you you know, you realize and you know how much I love fishing. Fishing yeah. fishing for me it's not a hobby, it's not it's a lifestyle. It's been all my life since I was a little kid. So fishing is too important for me to fish anything but the best. Period. If I'm there, guess what? I'm fishing the best. Anybody has another question for Rick, you can certainly ask now. Rick, I'm going to get you mixed up in something. I haven't even told Steve about this yet. I guess I'm going to do it now. But we were recently down uh, fishing in Sonata, and it was in, uh, it's in the first harbor you come to. As you come in to come out of the toll booth, and then you hang a quick right, and I've never been in there. You know when that really smell from the tuna when you first come into town? Well, it's in there, and it's a bunch of old commercial fishermen. And then Mike's in there, and a guy named Arnie's in there, mm -hmm. and they have. But you can see the commercial guys are not the best of shape financially. You know, right. I'm I'm surprised. You know, some of those boats don't 
no wonder. Anyway, Mike suggested, hey, you know, this winter, maybe you could do a little drive and get some wintertime clothing together because they could really use it. And then I said, well, perfect day to do that would be Dia de Reyes. Uh, Day of the Kings, mm -hmm. you know, when the mm -hmm. kings went to the baby Jesus, or it's called the Epiphany. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're going to put that together. Maybe you can come down to Ensenada with me and help me hand some of that stuff out. I think it'd be great. Yeah, yeah. no, it'd be great. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I, I <coughs> love all that kind of stuff. I know you do. You know, it's, it's uh, anything that deals with uh, with fishing, the industry, helping people, you know, in general. Uh, well, this guy too, Steve. I mean, he's the same thing. The other. The last time I talked to him, I was, hey, Phil, we've got, got some baby clothes for you coming up really soon. So um, I'm, I'm proud to say that we're always thinking about that also. We use that resource in Mexico so much. Those people are such lovely people, and sometimes they need a hand up. And exactly. uh, if we can do that, we're, we're ready to do that. Yeah, why not? That, that's awesome. Yeah. Anything else, Steve, that you can pick up? <clears throat> I don't think so. I think the, it's almost time for the, uh, the giveaway here. Okay. Yeah, are you ready for the giveaway, Rick? Right? Let's do it. I think we're going to do the tackle grab right now. All right. If Steve tells me what to do, it's usually push a button and read the name, and I always screw it up. Do I show the thing it's spinning? Sure. Okay. Just hit that tap, the blue button there, and then you'll And then will it stop? It'll stop on its own. Okay. Here we go, everybody. The Freeman Adventures tackle grab for October 3rd. And there we go. Can you see that, Steve? Uh, yeah. All right. Did it stop? It did. All right. And can you one? read the name? I can't read it for All here. right, let me look. It is Israel de la Cruz. Congratulations, Israel de la Cruz. He is today's tackle grab winner, and it sounds like a lot of great stuff, Steve, right? Yep, great package uh, that we put together for them. Thanks to Fishing Syndicate, thanks to our sponsors, Promar, Opsin, Big Fish Tackle. All those guys contributed to today's giveaway. And just become a Patreon member. Next Sunday morning, we're going to have another tackle grab, and we hope you become part of it. Rick, more than anything, it's good to see you, my friend. And oh, uh, the, the knowledge that you imparted to our audience was fantastic. I guess the downside is... We didn't get to cover it all, but the good side is you get to come back and we'll do it again really, really soon. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Continued success with Fishing Syndicate, my friend. Thank you so much. I'll work on my well. voice. And, uh, yeah, you're too much screaming going on. I know, too much on that amigo. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you for another live Freeman Adventures next Sunday morning.